I mean, I dropped in on schools all the time, uh, not to catch them off guard, but I just wanted to see a school as it is. I know that if I'm coming on official visit, I know things are different. I mean, I know they clean the blackboards a little bit. This, this that dates me right there. You know, we talk about blackboards. That's what we had in those days, blackboards. I remember one, one day just going to a district and it was exciting. The kids were excited. The teachers were excited. The administration was just there. I got into my car. I drove down the road 10 miles, seriously, 10 miles to another school district. And the superintendent was telling me how bad everything was. And I felt that in the school, and I <laughs> felt it all over. It just, it, it wasn't good. And I'm thinking, well, wait, what's going on? What's the difference, you know, about it? And so I, I probably changed to my 15 years as state superintendent from a very, very, very local controlled person who, by the way, was criticized a lot for lack of leadership because I'd say, no, let's stay out, let them run their own show, to one who probably didn't want to control but I sort of got to the point where I said, wait a minute, local control is not licensed to do nothing. And I wanted to take what I saw from the best and kind of instill that throughout the, throughout the state. I remember going all over the state, speaking to Rotary Clubs and everyone said, you better get interested in prenatal care and early intervention and, and early childhood education and support that because that is where we can make the difference. And I'm convinced to this day that that's an important factor. If you fail to do that, you're going to pay a price and you're going to, you're going to pay it forever. The real union movement came about during the same time, during, during my first part of my superintendency, because the collective bargaining law came into place in 73. And then I came into office in 75. And uh, that's when I wanted to learn a little bit about collective bargaining. And I went back to the University of Portland and got an MBA and to learn about labor management. And which gave me a, a healthy respect uh, for the unions. Now, keep in mind, you know, I was management. You know, so at times you're at odds. It's just by nature that that's exists. But I still respect the teacher. And I, I, I think um, we brought, we sort of brought the union movement on ourselves, too. I mean, I think there were some things that were really bad. And uh, the union stepped in and made it better. We came up with the Oregon Action Plan. So we put together task forces all over the state involving both education and people from the community. Uh, we had these different task forces and we, we made sure we had both education and community leaders and all over the state in it. We involved a couple thousand people just in that speaking around the state on those things and came up with some some things we need to be doing and uh, you know, improving the writing skills, the reading skills, and emphasizing those. Uh, uh, a longer day. It was grassroots from local school districts all around coming up to the state and then putting some uh, plans in place. Really a bit of a conservative and a lot of these issues were my comfort zone. And uh, I remember, in fact, my daughter was going to Willamette and I had to do a taping, TV taping show one evening, and she came over with me, and then we were going to go to dinner right over to the Capitol building, and then we were going to go to dinner. And I'm sitting there talking about, uh, uh, you know, I'm talking about condoms, and I'm talking about all sorts of things on television. And we walked away, and she said, Dad, you and I have never had this conversation before. I said, yes, and we just had our last one, too. <laughs> you know, but you know, here I am on television talking about, well, I was concerned about, I wanted an age education program, K through 12. K through 12. And the reason I did at K in first grade, third grade, they're on the playground, they're going to find what they might think is a balloon, or they might find a needle, all those possible, you know, and I wanted them to be very aware of what you might find there. But I think we did just, we tackled it and we said, hey, this is, we're going to be right up front with everything and deal with it. I have the Rajani situation going on. Everybody complaining about the teachers wearing religious garb. They were all wearing red, and then they wore the medulla with the Bhagwan's picture on it. The teachers were. Well, so I had ruled the Rajanish could not wear the medulla around their neck. 
people said, well, but they're still wearing the red. And I said, yeah, I have teachers all over the state wearing red today, so I can't say a teacher cannot wear red clothes. So you, I didn't. Really. So people were upset about that. In the meantime, I end up with this question of the the Eugene teacher, the Sikh, wearing the long gown and the the, the turban, and I. So I, I thought, oh my gosh, how do I deal with this? And the law is very clear. The superintendent shall, you know, the board will dismiss, you know, suspend the teacher, and the superintendent shall revoke the certificate. So Arno Denicky had been the chief justice of the Oregon Supreme Court, and he's retired. And so I thought, this is a tough one. And so I decided to hold a hearing, and I asked Arno to be my hearings officer. He came back with what I knew, he probably would come back with, said, you have no choice. Yeah, you know, the law says you shall revoke the teacher's certificate. So I revoked the certificate, but I wanted it to be challenged in the Supreme Court too because I didn't think it was fair. I, 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 I well, I loved the Senate. I really did. I was probably well as time went on. I was probably one of the most moderate members of the Senate, and I worked with two fantastic presidents of the Senate. Brady Adams, and then Gene Durfler, both of them. And I, I just have great respect for them. You have to be a team player, and that's an important thing in the legislature. You, you, you can't be out left field all the time. I mean, even though I didn't always vote with my party, uh, I still respected them, and, and I, I didn't... Uh, you know, I was with them on a lot of issues because I'm not a I'm not a flaming liberal. I'm not an ultra conservative. I'm a, I'm a moderate. They used to laugh. We, me, he was a pretty uh, uh, conservative Democrat, and I'm a pretty moderate kind of Republican. So we used to say a lot of times, "Oh, just have it bring a swing in the swings into the Senate chamber and let me he and I swing. We'll see which whichever way it goes that day. That that'll be the vote because we can be the swing votes, you know. You know, in Oregon we really have a strong ballot major system. In some states, you can't do that. You know, we, we have the initiative process where the people can, you can go to your kitchen table and write a bill and take it to the public and get it passed. And Bill Sizemore uh, had many, many measures that he brought to the people. And one of his that passed was a property tax limitation one. It's, but it was one of those cases where, uh, that's why well, I believe in the initiative, but I believe you have to be very, very careful about the initiative is that when you sit around the kitchen table and try to write a bill, do you have the feeling of what's everything in the state, the way it fits? You know, I have to laugh. Senator Uran, who was from Clackamas County way back in the turn of the century and so forth, and he was the, kind of the father of the initiative and the referendum in Oregon, which, as I said, the recall, which many states don't have. I, uh, a lady was telling me one time that she said in the late 30s, Senator Uran was a dinner guest at their home, and she said, he had a bit of a concern that it could, that it could be abused, and I think that uh, we have seen it abused a few times, and so you have to watch for that. I I really want that capital to tell a story, and I want the capital to be the people's place, and to, I want you know school children come in that building, and I want to see it. So, and so I the capital foundation and. Frankie Bell, who's been around for a long time, she used to be in charge of the Visitor Center and so forth. Gary Wilhelm and a lot of them were very instrumental in pushing for this kind of a concept. This was my bill that went in and established the Capital Foundation. And, you know, we started on a very meager basis, just getting a few things done, some benches in the uh, beautiful marble benches, though, in the uh, rotunda. And so it, it's really uh, been enhanced. So, uh, I want the people of Oregon to be involved, really involved with that, uh, that capital. I love the legislative process. I love the fact that in Oregon, in Oregon you can walk into the Capitol building, walk into any hearing room, and you can be sitting there and listening to the discussion, say, you know, I have something to say. Walk over to the clerk and say, I'd like to sign up to speak. And I can speak. Now, you can't do it during a work session, but during the hearing time, you can talk. Any, anybody off the street in the state of Oregon can go into the Capitol building and make a presentation to the legislative assembly. They were that open.